everybody! It's so cool Hello. that you made it here. As many of you know, I'm Pia, the director of Yoga Happiness at We Travel. Yes, that's my title. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> teaching um, yoga in the San Francisco Bay Area for about 10 years now. And I've been leading international retreats six years. <laughs> it's so interesting as I say that out loud, because um, it doesn't feel that long. It still feels really fresh and, and exciting. Um, and I lead, about, I lead about three international retreats a year and about two to three small, like, day-long local retreats. And up until I met Pia, I was organizing them um, all, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> I was doing everything on my own, from A to Z, and everything on retreats. So when I met Pia and we traveled, I, it was like, you know, the doors opened and it was almost like a big weight was lifted off my shoulders that there was this like amazing program that could be my admin assistant. Woo, yes. <laughs> you know, it's 
So, it's a little bit of So, how many reviews have you made on the organizing so far? How many have you? Yeah. Oh, I think I told you that the other day. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> you were like counting really slowly. I was counting really slow. Um, it was more than 10 international ones and so many more. Yeah, ones. I would say roughly 10 international retreats and then a, and then a lot of local. Um, yeah. Cool, great. Johannes. Yeah, great. Um, really glad to be here. It's a really cool setting actually for uh, an event like this. So I'm Johannes. I'm one of the co-founders of WeTrap. I'm originally from, from Switzerland and have been in the travel industry for pretty much my whole adult, adult life. I worked at the airport and then worked with groups in Switzerland. I then was working with uh, two non-profit organizations, Doctors Without Borders and the International Red Cross in Swaziland, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And while I was doing these jobs, I had always a lot of rest and relief and I took a lot of breaks in between missions as well. And during that time, less tours. Especially Central Asia was a really, really fascinating place because it's not a place that is easy accessible. So first I would just organize trips for friends, family, and then friends of friends. And after a while it would just be also just people that heard about these tours and signed up. And while I was leading these tours, I met a lot of other people that would do that, right? Maybe there they would be um, yoga retreat organizers in Africa, Southern Africa. Okay? Or they would be they would do cultural explorations in Central Asia just because they liked it. It wasn't their main job, they were the professional tour guide that would do this every week, but they would just do this on the side. And I realized that all those kind of semi-professional trip organizers or retreat organizers always have the same problems. Um, just managing the whole trip can be a nightmare, especially if you're not in the same country and if you don't know the trip person personally. Uh, but also promoting and marketing the trip can be really difficult. And this is really where the idea for We Travel came from. Um, I then uh, was very lucky to be able to, to get a scholarship and to come here to Berkeley about two and a half years ago now, almost three years ago. And yeah, here we are. And now we travel is, is alive and kicking. It's great. Yeah, and we're more and more going into the yoga market. So maybe, Sarah, you can share a little bit uh, your experience on how you prepared for your first retreat. Because I see there are lots of um, yoga teachers want to organize a retreat, but they have never done that before. Do you have any tips or recommendations that you could share regarding research and yeah, how to start? What are the first steps um, for organizing a retreat? Mm -hmm. So how many of you really want to lead your own retreat one day? Raise your hand. Letting go of fear. Letting go of fear. You really want to really want to do it. So now, nowadays, there's there's so many there's just there's so many things out there to where you can study, mentor with a teacher, go on your own retreat. There's lots of companies now that literally handle all the admin work for you, where you can just show up and, 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 and be the teacher, which is amazing. When I first started, I didn't know and I didn't feel that I had that support. So I went with a company called International Yoga. Have you guys ever heard of them? Okay, yes or no. So the, the owner, Michelle, she's been leading yoga retreats for, for years, with a lot of the Bay Area teachers here. And she handles everything from marketing to money handling to organizing your students' flights, everything. So that was my first experience working with Michelle with International Yoga. So, that was like my savior. She put me under her wing and, um, you know, she told me, she, one thing that she told me, she was like, you must take space for yourself when you're leading a retreat. Like go and, and retreat for yourself because you're gonna go bonkers. Because <laughs> everybody's asking you questions about downward dog and their chaturangas and meditation and blah, blah, blah. So that was really helpful. Um, but to be really honest with you, is I really didn't really didn't learn what to do until I was 
in there doing it. Day by day, feeling it out. I had my notebook, taking notes. This is what I would do, this is what I wouldn't do. That doesn't work, this really works. And so really that first retreat taught me so much about my future retreats. And every retreat, even now, every retreat that I lead, it gets stronger and it gets more dialed in and, and feels good. Every, every day. So, um, I, I know that you always have somebody who is assisting you and yeah. retreats. Mm -hmm. Would that be an opportunity maybe for teachers? Yeah, so the first thing I said was, you know, mentoring with, with um, a seasoned teacher. I think that's definitely one of the most powerful, potent tools that you can do and experience as a high um, that you can experience as um, a student. You know, once feeling what it feels like to be on retreat as a student, but then also being under your teacher's wing and seeing what's happening behind the scenes, you know? So if you do know a teacher that you're close with or a friend that's a seasoned teacher that leads these retreats, knock on their door, email them and say, hey, I'm super eager to learn what you're doing. And that's actually what I do. Every year I bring an assistant with me. Actually, Dina's sitting right here. Um, raise your hand, Dina. <laughs> and Dina's been on about four, um, two international retreats with me as a student and a couple local retreats. And so she was just on Mexico with me and I recently approached her when we got back from Mexico and, and asked her if she would be my retreat assistant for Costa Rica in August. And so that's what she's gonna learn so much from that retreat. Yeah, and t talking about your destinations already, so you mentioned Mexico and Costa Rica, do you go, how do you choose the retreat? From my heart. <laughs> no, um, yes and no. <laughs> you know, that is that is really choosing a retreat center is is so important. It is beyond anything, it is so important. Um, and choosing the right one, how to and why. For me, the number one thing is that a retreat center has to be very, very professional very organized, and they have to get back to me within a couple days. So professionalism is huge, because the last thing you want to do is take a group of 20 people to a retreat center, and they are all over the place. As a retreat leader, you want to feel like you can show up, and everything's taken care of, so the only thing that you do, you know, is teach and, and, and hold space for You don't want to worry about bed sheets. You don't want to worry about all kinds of stuff that can happen. <laughs> um, so professionalism is, is huge and, 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 and having really, really good organization skills. Um, and then all my retreats are at the ocean. They're, they're walking distance to the beach. Um, Why is that? Well, I'm also a surfer, aside from um, teaching yoga, so a lot of my retreats, I offer my students, um, me not personally, but it can be a surf and yoga um, retreat oftentimes. And so for me, um, yeah, the ocean is my church, it's my temple. And so if I can take a group of, of 20 of my students and give that experience to them of, of what it feels like to be submerged in the ocean um, and practice twice daily yoga and meditation, it's really, it's healing medicine for people, for myself included. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. I was actually, um, last January I was in Morocco on a surf and yoga retreat. Yeah. And that was just, I think it's just such a wonderful combination between these two activities because, mm -hmm. so it was, it was every morning, it was uh, yoga on the rooftop for sunrise then two surf sessions and then again yoga on the rooftop for sunset. And yeah. I mean, I never had a holiday where I went to bed at 8.30 every night, right? But like, <laughs> it, was, it was pure magic for your body, right? 
your body, your mind, your heart, your spirit, everything. And that's just what we did in Mexico. We had sunrise meditation on the rooftop. And then those that were surfing went and surfed for, you know, two, three hours. And then we come back, we had sunset, um, restorative yoga, and then dinner, and then we're in bed early. And it's, you know, by the end of the week, you just feel so replenished, connected to yourself, you feel in your power. Um, yeah, it's great. Right. I just wanted to go back to the retreat center and see how is there a way um, we travel could maybe help in um, finding the right retreat center? Yeah, I think that's something that's something we're looking more and more into, right? Uh, we start, start with certain geographies. Um, Morocco, Iceland, and we want to just have a, and for Ennis we have quite a few good connections there too. Uh, we definitely want to be able to go more into that. Uh, but of course, it's it's pretty hard to choose one, especially abroad, because you can't go visit them all the time. How do you do this? So yeah, I'd like to jump in on that. So um, one of the, the best things that I have ever learned is, and it's really, really important for me, is to, and I know this isn't quite available, you know, depending on your work and your finances, but going to the retreat center and experiencing it yourself, meeting the people that work there, um, staying there a couple days so you can taste the food, you can feel the vibe and the energy of the place is huge. I, um, yeah, I went to a few retreat centers where I didn't do that, and it wasn't, there's was a lot of things that I just, that, yeah, it was a bummer. So, so I made a promise to myself, you know, to always go experience it for a day or two and, 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 and meet the people that work there, the owners perhaps, the retreat coordinator, you know, eat the food. Food's important for me. I, you know, I really want people to come and, and, and be happy. And, um, so that's huge. That's that's really really awesome. important. That's good advice. Yeah. So let's talk about promotion. Mm -hmm. How do you promote your retreats? Do you have advice for people out there? What's what's your strategy? Mm -hmm. So the the best way to to promote your your retreat, your future retreat, is really building relationships in the classroom. That is going to be your audience, and those are the people that are, the majority of the people that are going to come on retreat are the people in the classroom. Um, that relationship that you build there, they're definitely more likely to trust you to take them, you know, out of the country and spend a week with you. Um, so that's the most powerful, potent way to market is having these one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, hey, I think you know you could really benefit from this. I could see that you really need this in your life right now. Um, and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then from there, also sending personal uh, email invites. Those are definitely ways. And then I would say, um, you know, third way would definitely be social media, you know. Um, but again, there's so many yoga retreats. You guys, there's so many. There's so many yoga teachers. So you're just gonna look like another person, like, well, Sarah's going to Costa Rica. Okay, so does everybody else. So what's, you know, what is gonna make an impact on these people that you connect with? It's gonna be you reaching out to them, the work that you do in the classroom. Um, I also work with people privately with yoga. I do private yoga, and so I get a lot of my private yoga students to go to. Um, but I'm also at this point to where I do wanna branch out and figure out you know, ways to market to people that I'm not seeing every day. So that's something that I want to grow. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. tips. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, some there's, tips. there's some tech tips, but maybe just some, some more general things about promotion needs to start with. I mean, the first retreat you'll ever lead will be the hardest of deal. Mm -hmm. That's just because um, yeah. you don't have the experience yet how to do the marketing, but also people have a harder time trusting you if it's your first retreat, which yeah. is natural. Um, and the only way to do the first retreat or the first retreats is really through your very close personal network. Mm -hmm. And that can feel a bit strange in the beginning, because, because, 
because you really try to get these people to come to a place and you don't want to seem too pushy because they're really your friends. But at the same time, you have to just try to convince them nevertheless. <laughs> um, I think if you talk about who will come on your retreats, in the beginning, it's your first personal connections and then maybe one connection away from them. The great thing is that once you start organizing these retreats, I mean, Sarah, you certainly now have people that have been with you on a yoga retreat three years ago that you might even not even touch that much anymore. Mm -hmm. And then they come again with a friend. So that actually, with time, you actually get almost to 30 reconnections. Yeah. And here is actually what we realized, or what I saw now on our website, is that it kind of pays off, of course I'm saying this to promote we travel as well, but it kind of pays off to actually use uh, a site where it looks like you're um, organizing it more professionally, mainly for the reviews. So we have um, one of our most active organizers, he's a dance teacher in San Francisco, his name is Ramon, he does dance trips to Cuba for the last, you know, it's great, I love Ramon. And he's, he's done these trips for the last five years. And you normally would do one or two a year with um, six to ten people. And since he's on We Travel, and since he has quite a all his reviews are phenomenal, um, and since people see that he's done two of these trips already last year, now this year he filled by June, he's going on his third one, and this one is now full with 28 people. So um, I think just the fact that you're on a site and you, if you have reviews from past retreats and that people can look at them as well, will maybe allow you to not go to only to your first degree network and maybe to the second one, but reach maybe to the third ring or so as well. In the end, it's still going to be your personal network flow that is going to be instrumental in actually getting your retreat built. Um, yeah, I have a few tech tips to share just from my personal experience. One is, whenever possible, just start a mailing list. You can customize it. Um, start a MailChimp just to Go to MailChimp, create your account. Um, we're going to send out all, uh, a deck of all of the stuff that I'm mentioning right now, David. Um, yeah, do a MailChimp account. It's easy. Just add everybody, also all your friends, all your family members, whoever might there be that you want to keep informed. Because normally, when you then send out a reminder or so, if you don't do this, you always forget somebody. And it just saves you a lot of time. Um, the second software I used a lot when I was organizing my own tours in Central Asia was um, Conva.com. Um, it's a very it, it's a very easy to use kind of Photoshop tool online. It's like Photoshop, but you don't have to know Photoshop. It's just drag and drop of pictures, and you can make really good looking flyers or, or um, letters in very little time that you can hand out or that you can promote um, in your studio or send to people via email as well. It also makes really nice Facebook Facebook banners, etc. It's a great tool just to look visually attractive as well. Uh, we also have a service on our site that we actually create a flyer for you automatically um, in a standard format. But if you want to go beyond that, just design your Facebook page or your own page, whatever it might be. Um, thirdly, that really kind of pays off to having a website. Um, in 2016, there's not really an excuse anymore not to have a website. Uh, th there's, there's kind of two ways to go there. One is the classic way, which is a WordPress website, um, which has been around forever. Um, it's, it's kind of the blog website that everybody uses. It's good, it's very versatile. If you want to have a lot of options, then it's good to go for WordPress. Um, but nowadays, there's also kind of these ready-made website builders, which are much, much easier to use. And they literally take a couple of minutes to set up. Um, there's Wix, there's Weebly, and there's Squarespace. Wix and Weebly have three completely free versions where you just have their advertising on your own site. Um, Square page, Squarespace, uh, Squarespace costs $8 a month or so. It's, it's very affordable, and you can have your own URL, etc. I think uh, our own web page definitely helps. It will not, people will not discover your own web page, but it just helps again, like with reviews, it helps with trust and confidence, which is really important because people come with you for a week or two, right? It's a, it's a significant investment of their time. Then social media, I think I would really pick one. Uh, rule of thumb if you have people over 30, use Facebook. If you don't, if they're younger, um, use Instagram or Snapchat. Um, <laughs> what do you use? Do you use Facebook or maybe yeah, what's for you? Yeah, it's mostly Facebook. Mostly, yeah. Yeah. Same I here. have an Instagram, I'm very active on it, um, but Facebook, Facebook, just because I've been using it a lot longer, so I have more you know, followers and, and a 
lot of my students are on there and, and you know, colleagues and other teachers and stuff. Whereas Instagram's like pretty new for um, some of us seasoned okay. teachers. <laughs> um, one, one last tech tip maybe is that it's really interesting. So normally the best time to send out emails in the business world is between 3 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. With yoga, we found that's not true. <laughs> the best time to send out yoga emails or reminders is actually early in the morning, seven o'clock or so, or even earlier, so that people have to see this the first thing in the morning. It seems like a lot of yoga teachers or people that do a lot of, a lot of yoga are very active in the morning and just get a lot of things done early on. And um, yeah, so if we send out reminders or social media updates, whatever it might be, we do it early in the morning. Cool, great advice. Um, what about the price? So there, it's really, I think, me as well, I'm a, also a yoga teacher and I'm looking into organizing a trade exhibit. How do you pick the right price? So how do you do that, Sarah? Well now, you know, most of the retreat centers have everything laid out for you. So they have the cost, you know, seven nights, accommodation, and blah, blah, blah. You're Food, your airport transfers. So they have that ready for you. So then you need to add on your retreat rate. And so, you know, when I when I decide that, I definitely take into consideration the classes that I'm missing, the private clients that I'm missing, um, the travel costs for me. And I add that all up. And I make sure that that is definitely getting and, um, and then I also think about the time, because I do everything on my own, I think about the time that I use marketing, my marketing costs, um, and my time and my energy there. Because yes, we're on a yoga retreat, but as a retreat leader, you are working. Right, Nadine? Yeah, <laughs> all the time. You are, you are on. Even if you're on the beach, kicking back, and you're like, oh, I just had an awesome class, you are still on. <laughs> your students are coming to hang out with you. They're asking you questions about your personal life. They're asking you questions about their practice. And, and there's, there's a lot that goes on there. So, um, so you want to find a number that feels really good for you, something that covers all your costs. And then, OK, you know, I'm going to be seeing my students seven days a week, eight hours a day. How does that feel for you, you know, energetically, financially, um, as a business leader? How does that, you know, feel for you? Um, and then you also have to take into consideration, you don't want to give yourself this big um, rate, okay, I'm going to charge them $1,200. And then you add that with your retreat cost, and then you have this huge rate. Not going to work either, because nobody can so you have to find something that looks good on the eye. You know, okay, this is gonna add up to 1650 after all said and done. Okay, great. You know, so you can't you can't lowball yourself because you are worth that you are worth receiving and you can't you can't make it high so nobody signs up. Okay. Yeah. So there's that's kind of how I, I did my oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I approached that similarly when I did my tours. Um, business school student that could pour you for hours with pricing yeah. strategies, but um, this, it's really not, it's, I think you just have to go with something that seems fair. So what I normally did is, okay, I expect 10 people to come. I said I will also do it if I do have five. So I kind of set expected salary or whatever you want to call it um, at 10 people. Let's say that it costs me $1,000, then I mark it up for $200, expected salary is $2,000. If I only get $1,000 out of it, um, I'm still okay with it, not great, but I'll still do it. Um, that's kind of how you come to a somewhat fair price. And then of course it's also important to see what other people are charging, right? A good, a good measurement is in the yoga I imagine is the retreat center because they, the other teachers will pay the same thing, so you kind of go on there, if you charge them $800 more, that will look weird. Yeah. Um, and then you look around maybe in your studio what other people are charging for the destinations. But then if you, if you look online, I mean, the, the range, you can go on a yoga retreat for $400 if you want to, but you're also gonna get what you paid for. Exactly. So, um, 
yeah, you, you have to have some find some some kind of good ground and also just talk to people that you think will actually join your retreat because often you already know who's a likely customer. Cool. Sarah, you talked already that you're always uh, organizing your retreat uh, on the shore of an ocean. <laughs> with retreats is you never know exactly who you're going to get. So I can definitely plan a theme, but I could get there and it's just not what's needed. So I teach in a way that's very, very intuitive into who's in and on my retreat. Um, yeah, and um, so no, but when I get there, you know, I, I do prep. I do prep before and um, but there's not a, there's not a set theme prior. Yeah. But you always integrate with surfing lessons. So how is the schedule looking like? From you already pointed at it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to. Yeah. So um, you know, my last retreat that I did, it was it was labeled a surf and yoga retreat. The surf part is not mandatory because if you do make make it mandatory, you're going to lose out on potential yogis that want to sign up for you. I've learned that on a past retreat. Um, so I, I make it, what I do is I offer two things. I offer a yoga package and then a yoga and surf package. And then if the people are just doing yoga, they're doing yoga and maybe they're swimming, you know, out on the beach or just beach bumming or whatever. And then I, um, and then I have my, my surf and, um, my surf yogis that are, you know, doing their surf lessons throughout the retreat. Um, and so how, what that retreat looked like is every morning we did sunrise meditation for 15, 20 minutes, and then we went into an hour and a half of asana practice. And then we went and had breakfast. And then the, the students that um, had surf lessons would go off and, and, and have their surf lessons in town. And would serve for probably about two to three hours, and then we would come back and we would all meet for evening restorative uh, yoga and meditation, and then dinner. So that was kind and of then immediately. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, and then you're done. You're toast. <laughs> um, so that was um, that retreat. My Costa Rica retreat. Um, we're literally walking distance to the surf. So if you wanted to surf, you could walk right on in and surf after yoga, or get a surf lesson right after yoga, but it's not mandatory on my retreats, but it's available, and I need it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a big server, so. I am, and you know, it's like I said earlier, it's really important as a retreat leader to take care of your needs while you're on retreat, because you really have to show up for your students while you're there. Meaning, you know, make sure that you're getting a practice in, you're getting some meditation in, Finding some alone time somewhere to decompress and to kind of refill again. So it's really, really something to take into consideration when you're mapping out your schedule. Maybe you can just tell a little bit again about the the sort of people who participated in, in Morocco. So what was really good for you during the daily schedule? What what did you feel like? Um yeah, I think it's it, it's really from a kind of bodily healing perspective. I never appreciated yoga mm -hmm. as much for its restorative function as during the surf retreat. Um, because normally, if I go surfing here, I go a day or two on a weekend. But then you can just do nothing all week, and you're going to be fine again. You can recover well. But if you go for a whole week and you go surfing every day, even if it's just one surf um, session a day. 
you're going to feel it after 30 days or four days. Your body's really going to tell you that, that you're doing something very intense. And this restorative yoga at night was just so, yeah, so incredibly releasing. And um, yeah, no, I just thought it was, it's a great combination. Yeah, I can add into that. Um, the, the morning practice typically, well, all the time for, for my retreats are an energizing. Was that yours too, yeah. like an energizing movement practice? Exactly. Yeah. So that's really wonderful to start with a, a vigorous movement practice in the morning, especially for the yogis that aren't surfing. So they feel like they're getting some movement, some juice in. Um, yeah, and then after surfing for a couple hours, it is heavenly to come back to your yoga mat and literally just lay on your back and do these very mild, mild stretches and breath work. And it's, it's a beautiful balance of the two. So the retreat offers, you know, a balance of rest and relaxation, but also fun and adventure if you want it. Cool. What do you think are the pluses and Co-leading a retreat. Yeah. Uh, do you have experience? I that? do. Oh, cool. I do. I'm co-leading one um, in April in Bali with Dave Laurel. Does anybody know Dave yeah. Laurel? Yeah. Um. Yeah. There's pluses and minuses. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, my very first retreat actually was co-led, and that actually felt really good because I had a buddy with me, and I'm like, we're doing this, and it was like, it was both. You know, our first time doing it, and we had been friends for a long time. She's also a yoga teacher. And so it was nice to have that buddy system, that support. And um, something that came up for me, that first retreat co-leading was, you know, I felt like I was doing all the marketing and the pushing and the selling and the da 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 And then my partner wasn't so much. So that was an issue, you know. So just make sure if you're going to co-lead that, you guys are on the same page. You guys are pretty clear about what, what you're doing in terms of that. So that was a little challenging, you know. Um, and uh, but the plus to that is again, you you have somebody to at the end of the day like decompress with and, and, and kind of go over the day and, and help you to navigate through some situations or, or problems that might be happening on the retreat or um, share. Uh, you know, you guys can evenly disperse the energy that, that needs to be going out to everybody. And, um, typically what we did is she would teach one class and then I would teach the other. So rather than me teaching both classes and both meditations, you can, you can split up the, the retreat, which is really nice, really, really nice. So, and you know, the, the other, um, you're not gonna make as much because you have to you know split the rate so it's not going to be one of your big money-making retreats when you co-lead with a teacher. Um, so you still have to keep the... Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's, that, that would, would have been a question. Yeah. Yeah. And I would make sure, you know, if you do co-lead with a teacher, you know, find somebody that you really, you know, mesh with, that your teaching styles can be weaved together, where it's not going to be like a jarring transition of, you know, teaching styles or... Yeah, and also make sure that the marketing is fairly attributed afterwards. So, yeah. <laughs> on our website, that I just asked, um, we see this often that it's a standard question at the end if there's more than one organizer or more than one paid person promoting it. That uh, in our travel information field, where you can ask for everything from a meal preference, whatever you need from the travelers, one field is how did you hear about them? And then you have four options it was mm -hmm. this person A, B, C, or D. And then you also make sure that the person gets credit for it. Yeah, that's actually, that's actually a good segue into the next question I wanted to ask you. What sort of information do you need from your participants in order to successfully hold the retreat? What do you ask for? As much info as you can get. <laughs> do, do, do your stu students give the info to you? Yeah, I have, a, um, I have a list of things in my registration form that I ask for. Um, I think some of the key things that you definitely want to get is injuries, um, medications that they might be on. Um, those are two uh, important ones. Um, kind of blanking. Allergies. Allergies. That's another big one. 
food. Um, and then uh, dietary needs. Mm -hmm. um, and yoga at that or do you ask for yoga experience? I do, I do. And because I'm so, I'm, I'm so involved in my retreats and, and how I lead them and how I organize them that I'm usually on the phone with my people that are signing up and we're, we're connecting over the phone um, or back and forth through email. So I get a lot of information, especially if they're not my regular student or my regular client. I try and get as much as I can so I can, you know, really facilitate a good experience for them while they're on retreat. Um, for example, just to give you an example, this past retreat, I had three elderly women. Um, one was in her late 60s, one was 75, one was like early 60s. And so two of them, you know, the Hatha practice was not appropriate for their body, it just wasn't. But I'm not going to turn them down because they can't do a Hatha practice, right? So I got as much information as I and I said, hey, you guys can do the restorative practice. And then my retreat um, assistant that came, she actually specialized in pool yoga, therapeutic pool yoga. So we offered them pool yoga instead of hatha yoga. So um, that's just one example. So you just really want to pull as much information as you can. You don't want to be pushy, but you know, talking over the phone, email correspondence really, really helps. And then definitely having, you know, we travel has that is that you can make your own unique questionnaire for your students to fill out. What's your favorite color? You know, like it can be anything, you know, what what's your favorite nature activity? You can really get creative with it and you can customize it on we travel, which I really, really love that. And so yeah, you just want to get as much information as you can about your students that are coming so you can hold space for them, make sure that they're comfortable and, and well taken. When you bring adults on retreats, they tend to, <laughs> and you might actually know about this, they kind of go back to being um, yep. like, take care of me. <laughs> so you, you, you really have to, yeah, you, you want to take care of them. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah actually, on, uh, on Vidral on platform, we have that um, questionnaire that people can fill out, and you, as a retreat organizer, you can just add as many questions as you want. What sort of information do you give to your students? So how much do you give in advance and in what time spans in advance? Do you send out emails? How do you reach out to them? Yeah, so prior to um, departing on retreat, I usually send out three group, two to three group emails to, to who's coming. And the first one is I send out a detailed um, email about travel tips and packing. Um, just to, again, help, help my students feel supported. And some people are really savvy travelers, and, and they got it, and they don't want any help. They're like, oh, I'm easy, I just need one bag and my flip-flops, and I'm good. <laughs> and then you have other students that, like, you know, they really, really want you to hold their hand and tell you exactly what to pack. So, <laughs> after years of doing this, of going back and forth and, and um, you know, just telling everybody one by one, you know, I made I made this, you know, this email about detailed, detailed packing list um, and, and travel tips and what to expect at Pranamar or wherever we, retreat center that I'm at. So that's one email that I send. And then the, the last email that I send, which is really, really, really important, and it's, it's labeled, um, Retreat guidelines. Okay, retreat guidelines. And you might think to yourself, well, why do you need to like why do you need to do that? Um, but you really want to you want to hold firm boundaries with your students, and you want to. And this is just me personally. Your retreat might be different, but um, you really want to hold firm boundaries with your students, and you want your students to show up to practice on time, ready to practice, like every practice that's on the schedule. Um, that's really important for me as a retreat leader and to hold the group dynamic. 
I don't like students showing up late or missing practices unless there's an excuse like I'm sick, I'm injured, I'm not well kind of excuse. So in that, in that email, um, I talk about the importance of showing up on time to every class, every practice, every meditation. Um, I talk about alcohol intake. Okay, so there's a lot of yoga retreats where they're going and they're boozing up and it's a party and it's not my retreat. So um, I definitely talk about the alcohol intake because again, you get people in Mexico, you get people in these tropical paradises and it's like, woo, yoga and margaritas. <laughs> like, <laughs> it can go there if you let it go there. So um, it's important to set the tone prior to leaving. And then again, when I'm there, talk about it with the group. Um, so those are my two like, really important emails. Of course, the retreat schedule and itinerary is in there as well. Um, yeah. And you send it out by email. Yeah, via email. Via email. Yeah. One thing that I found always very neat is when I was doing my trips is can connect with people beforehand. Uh, when I did it back in the days, it was mm -hmm. just via Facebook group. We're now working to have this more and more on our platform. But it's just a, a cool thing. If once you sign up for a trip, you see afterwards, oh, these other seven people are going, and I can message them. Uh, we're now kind of want to figure, we want to have a feature where if any time somebody signs up, at the end, they see why other people are excited about this retreat, and they leave a little note there, just kind of introduce themselves. I think that kind of helps to, it, it just makes the people more curious, it makes them more excited. Yeah. It builds, um, it builds a, builds a buzz around um, your retreat. So I actually do that with Facebook. I yeah. always make a, an event page and um, everybody that's going, they, you know, they say that they're going and then it's just really fun and cute because then it, I get this wonderful feed and, and everybody starts communicating with each other and like, oh, I'm so excited and I can't wait and, you know, this is my second year in a row and, you know, and so it's, it just builds a nice community, and it builds just some buzz around it, and people, yeah, people get to see what's going on. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's important, too, because if you want to go on a group trip, you kind of want to know who is in this group. Yeah. And, yeah. Cool. I have to say, though, there is something really special also about just not knowing as well and just getting there and seeing. Like, something really true. special about that, too. Very true. Yeah. I think you can go for both. We, yeah, actually, we yeah. actually have one. Uh, we have one very special person on our on our website. Uh, he mainly uh, his participants are mainly from the Afro American community, mainly people that have never traveled internationally, and he does um, completely anonymous, uh, not anonymous, routes, but complete surprise um, trips. So he doesn't tell the people where they go, when they go. He tells them, okay, be at the airport at that time and have a passport, and that's all you need to know. And I think that has kind of, uh, has, has some charm to it too, but it's not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, you go somewhere cold and you're like, oh, I just Exactly. It's like, yeah, <laughs> oh, it's tropical yeah. dress here. Oh, too bad. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, I think the trips there is just called either passport required or non-passport required. Yeah, exactly. really. That's really cool. Cool. Um, I think I'm, we just want to open up for questions. Do you have any? Questions or anything that you want to ask Sarah or Yeah. I'm just curious about um, insurance and liability, especially when you're taking people internationally. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I have a waiver that I have my uh, students sign. And then um, the retreat center has a waiver for my students to sign. Yeah. And do you, do you guys offer something? Yeah, absolutely. So we require people have insurance on our site uh, and we also just sell it automatically when people sign up we have a relatively easy easy way a good partner who has been very reliable so far so also when it came to for instances but yeah you definitely want to protect yourself just by having them sign the waiver yeah and, and also maybe encourage your students to get travel insurance yeah. in case there's any way yeah. whatever it might be yeah. their bags get lost uh, whatever well, right. yeah. they get sick
into a deep practice like this, and depending on your teaching style and what you have under your belt, you can take your students really deep, and a lot of stuff comes up, a lot of stuff. Um, so it's definitely something to think about, you know, and how, yeah, you know, how do you manage that if somebody's totally having a freak out on your retreat? How are you going to handle it? Um, you know, and that could be something to where you, you know, if you have somebody sign up, you know, maybe that's in your, the form, like, you know, anything that they need to add, you know. Um, but yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of um, students have breakdowns on retreats. I've never had that, no. No, 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 no. no. There's always been like a, a good turnout afterwards. But I, but no, I've never had that happen. Yeah. And other folks. What about the virtual community? So we're pretty, I just might have to repeat the question that, that is also recorded. So the question is just how V-Travel works, actually. What is V-Travel doing? So V-Travel is really a management platform for the organizer. So it's uh, the reason why we exist is to make Sarah's life easier. Um, you go on there, you create your trip, you create a listing, uh, which looks very professional. You can detail all kinds of things. So you then can share this listing with your community. You can also embed it in your own website, uh, you can, or you can just send the link around in an email, or whatever it might be. And instead of then people PayPaling you or giving you checks or Venmoing you uh, or bank account transfer, whatever you might use, they just sign up directly on our site. Um, they sign up and they pay via their check-in account. And if they use their check-in account, the platform is completely free for the organizer and the traveler. Or they can also pay by credit card, in which case they just pay the 3% standard credit card fee. But then the really powerful thing about it is the dashboard, where, where Sarah would go into and she manages the whole retreat. You see everybody that signed up. If somebody cancelled, uh, cancels, you can do it with one click. Um, you can also have several different options. Let's say you have a different package, or you offer surf lessons on top of that. Maybe they're $200 more. Um, it, you have it all in there in this management platform. Um, you can download all the information as Excel. If people want to add stuff later or cancel stuff later, let's say they decided against surfing or they want a better room, whatever it might be, they just go onto WeTravel and add it on there. It basically just saves you a lot, a lot of time as the organizer. Uh, we also offer flights, hotel, etc., to the users afterwards. This is how we make a bit of money. But we are not a travel agency. We don't want to be because then we couldn't have the hundreds of trips that we currently have on the site at the same time. Um, we really, uh, we actually travel, uh, we work together with travel agencies or with the retreat sensors. We don't want to be in competition with them, right? We really just want to be a tool for the organizer to, to make their lives easier. And we're currently still completely free and remain so, and plan to remain so. Yeah, I think it's definitely something we want to expand to. And there we are actually, given that we now have dozens of, of retreats already in our platform that are happening, I think we're really amassing a good amount of information about retreat centers as well. We're probably going to start specializing in certain regions first because covering the whole world at once is really difficult. 
but uh, Iceland is popular. We're definitely going to look into Costa Rica because there's just so much going on there, Mexico. Um, since we are in, an, in the Bay Area and based here, we are first going to look at the top locations here and then expand, expand from there. Yeah, but definitely we, we want to be able to offer that sort of more of a kind of discovery service for the organizers as well. What we have in mind is some, something where we don't just show you a thousand retreat center and all the trip advisory reviews that are out there because you already have that anyway, but make it almost like a, a close community where you get access once you actually have a trip on we travel and you, you do that because then you just feel freer to give a, a, a real review and to recommend to, to fellow yoga teachers centers or places. It's just, you it, it create more trust if people are feel free to actually say what they're reading. I think what would be helpful um, for you know teachers, um, if you guys somehow got reviews from the teachers that have been going to these certain centers, and and, and you know we can go on there and see oh Nadine's been to um, you know Costa Rica you know five years in a row it must be a good place you know that could be yeah. one way to, to do it yeah. that would be helpful yeah absolutely we have, that's definitely part of our kind of um, the information we want to gather after you come back from retreat, right? yeah. because that's definitely useful for the teachers in the future. And for Iceland, you're working on something. Pure, <laughs> you sent me. Yeah, I'm going to Iceland. Oh, cool. Any more questions? What about the Facebook community, Zaki? Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Where, no questions. Our virtual friends. No questions either. <laughs> Nobody's commenting anything? Hello. <laughs> Maybe they're starting to write and they see that we can. I just had another yes. um, What is the minimum age you expect? It's a great, great question. I've had lots of students ask if they can bring their kids to, um, yeah, actually two years ago I had um, one of my close students, she asked if she could bring her, her two kids and, and uh, of course, part of me wanted to say yes, um, but no, just for my retreat. Because <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of my you know a lot of people want to get away and want space from that. Um, so again, it's important to create an environment that you that you want for your people to experience. But the youngest that I've had um, on retreat, I think, was um, like eighteen. So. Um, yeah, as long as, as, you know, they're respectful, you know, and fine. So I would, I would say 18, maybe 17. You have to feel it out, you know? You really have to feel it out. Um, yeah. What I've seen now with three people that organize trips on our site is that after they had a couple of successful retreats, they actually plan a family retreat. So it's a special, it's a, it's a specific retreat where you're allowed to bring family and it's for families. Then it's also clear, I think. That's, that's yeah, clear. that that's the space that they're entering, exactly. and, and that's really nice too for people that do have kids. It's really hard to find childcare, and they also only have a week off and want to do a family vacation, but also take care of themselves. So yeah. I've thought about that, but it would be a lot to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any other questions? There's got to be more questions. I'm curious about. I'm not a yoga instructor, but I am curious about the idea of running a, like partnering yoga for some sort of property, as you guys said, with other sports. So, for example, running or hiking. So you still choose to surf and yoga combo, um, where you go to a resort and surf is already like the infrastructure for the surf buses and the instructors and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. Can you guys speak to when that doesn't exist and you kind of have to bring in your own planning? And question is about um, yeah, making a combination of yoga and something else and if there's uh, um, yeah, if we have to or how you would bring an expert into your retreat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done, um, I've done some local day long yoga and hiking uh, retreats but I was the, the hike leader <laughs> and the um, yoga teacher. But yeah, you could definitely, if you wanted to lead, you know, if you wanted to say, you know, I wanted to do a yoga and running retreat, um, and you were my 
the running coach, you know? I would definitely bring you in and, you know, have, you know, yoga and running in Napa, you know? And it's doable. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's all kinds of great things nowadays, yoga and rock climbing, yoga and backpacking, yoga and skiing. Um, so the, the, the options are endless and you can get so creative, you know, and, and I think just really creating something that you're super passionate about. And when you're passionate about it, your students feel it. And that's how they're going to sign up, is, is, is feeling your passion for what it is that you're offering. I think it also helps create that special personal touch because in the end that's why people are going to come, yeah. right? They can go to any retreat center they want to on, a, on their own, um, but it's really kind of the personal, the personal plus that you bring into it. Yeah. And if it's uh, whatever it might be, yeah, rock climbing, running, you know, it's definitely a great way. I mean, for me in Central Asia, it was just knowledge of the area, but also knowledge of how a European feels. Um, <laughs> so whatever. The more personal knowledge and passion you can bring into it, the better. And if it's going to make it more special and exotic, yeah. don't worry about it too much. Cool. Yeah. Um, is there going to be a place, and, and each person's profile is being obviously overseas, you can screen capture passports and visas? So if somebody loses your visa or passport, or you're somewhere and suddenly you're, at, you know, you're crossing over, and will it be somewhere you can say, oh, we've got it here, or God can they lose it, and you have one to the embassy? If that's the point, though. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is about passport losing, if there is a service. And visas. Yeah. And visas. Yeah. About like, re recovering them, or? Because we're going to put a capture on the site. Where when somebody uploads their file, and they upload the photo capture of that information. And even for that, we need travel insurance or health insurance. Yeah, we honestly haven't thought about that yet. It also hasn't come up that much as a user request, to be very honest. Um, but, but I think, honestly, it's probably one of the things that would be extremely useful to tell people in your preparation email. That's in my list. I have the um, students. Yeah, so we have a lot of trips where we collect the passport information, right? So that, that is definitely that is something that will be available relatively soon, where you can also upload your passport, because for quite a few trips you need it, for whatever reason. Um, yeah, but then, of course, uh, Having worked at the airport for a long time, there's all, nationalities have all kinds of different rules. It's crazy. Um, sometimes it's enough to just write a letter yourself. Sometimes you need a police letter. Sometimes you need actually to go to the embassy to be able to go back home. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's not a pleasant thing. I think it also helps just for the instructor to have an ID of the people, not just for a hotel or for. Suggested. We suggest a couple of things, right? We definitely want to get dietary restrictions, maybe an emergency contact them. I don't want to yeah. interrupt yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. So Thanks so much. Anything else? Okay. Nothing from the Facebook community? Okay. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Sarah and Johannes, thank you. Thank you. for sharing your experience. And, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much to Yoga Smoke again for the space. Yeah. Uh, it's great to be here. I just have four more points on my list here. And you can talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want, you can just leave us your email address. So we keep you posted about the future events that are coming up. And it's always going to be about yoga and travel. So we haven't decided on the next.
guess, but it's gonna be real in this in this segment. The yeah. podcast is gonna put together like a small slide deck just summarizing summarizing all the points. Um, for example, emails that Sarah sends out or the tech tools I mentioned. Yeah, that's for sure. And also the video is going to be available on the Facebook event page. If you wanna check it, check back again. And take advantage of the twenty percent. Have a look at the beautiful clothes of Yoga Smoga and you get twenty percent off today. And if you know anybody organizing a retreat and having trouble, tell them So thank you so much for being here all together and let's have some snacks, wine and water. Thank you. Just press this, finish. Mm, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, that's what you have.